All right, testing one, two, excellent. Good evening, my name is Hunter, and this is the first content review live stream for Gen Chem students in Chemistry 223. Uh, tonight we're gonna be going with, in the next couple of streams, actually we're gonna be going over concepts around acid-base equilibria. This is something that is applicable to a lot of different parts of uh, chemistry, organic and inorganic, and so it is worthwhile spending some time uh, with these concepts and with these exercises. And it's a good mix of qualitative and quantitative reasoning, which I, I kind of like bridging those where we can. So chapter 14 in the OpenStax textbook, you can have this pulled up alongside while you're working on this. There are some tabulated values that I will be pulling in from there. So I think that's all the admin stuff I've got for you. Next week, I will be recording an episode the day before, so it, it'll just be recorded. There won't be an opportunity for live stream unless you want to do this with me at like eight o'clock at night. So that's all I got for you. Okay. Show by suitable net ionic equations that each of the following species can act as a Bronsted-Lowry base. So Bronsted-Lowry definition of acids and bases, this simply means that let me get, here we go. Um, a Bronsted-Lowry base accepts protons. And that's all that means. So by contrast, a Bronsted-Lowry acid donates protons. So that's the easiest way to kind of keep track of this. So, so show by suitable net ionic equations that each of the following species can act as a, can act as a Bronsted-Lowry base. So we're starting with water, and this is always going to be in its liquid state at standard temp and pressure. And if we're showing that it can act as a base, then we need a sum source of protons. So this will be aqueous protons, aqueous hydrogen. And we're just looking at this in one direction. Very often, these acid-base reactions will be in equilibrium, which would be shown with these bi-directional arrows. We're not worried about that right now. And water takes on that additional proton and its positive charge to make aqueous hydronium is what this would be called. Hydronium. When you see hydronium written in a balanced equation or as a product or a reactant in these acid-base formula, um, you can just as easily write it as just, just protons. That is a source of proton um, in your balanced equation. All right, so now we're looking at hydroxide, OH negative. And hydroxide is going to be a component in a lot of strong bases. So we add our source of protons. Those combine, and you should get liquid water as your byproduct. Next, we have ammonia. Aqueous ammonia can take on protons. And I forget what NH4 is called, but you'll see that one an awful lot. We don't need to worry about those two. Hydrogen phosphate with its negative charge. Do keep track of your charges here. Oh, excuse me. We're adding protons. Not everyone circles the, the charges I like to because it reminds me um, to check them, if nothing else, and it makes them a little bit more apparent. So the single positive charge in the proton is canceling out the single negative charge on our other reactant here to give us a neutral product. Identify and label the Bronsted-Lowry acid and its conjugate base, as well as the Bronsted-Lowry base 
and its conjugate acid in the following equations. So when an acid reacts, when an acid gives up its protons in this context, the product that it forms or what's left over is its conjugate base. Acid goes to base, base goes to acid, right? So looking at this first equation, which species is our bronsted lowry acid? Well, it's probably the one with excess protons, but which between these is going to be, um, without looking at the Ka values or without having memorized that some of these are more acidic than the other, um, we really have to look at our products to see, to kind of work backwards and know what our acids and bases are. Um, because water is taking on a proton, that is our base. So HNO3 is our, let me get this in red. This is our acid. And its conjugate base, or CB, is NO3 minus. It's giving up that proton, losing that positive charge, or rather taking on a negative charge. And water is becoming hydronium. This is our bronsted base forming hydronium or conjugate acid. And we know that it's an acid because it has a proton that it wants to give up. So moving on, cyanide and water, same exercise. Looking at our product side, water has given up a hydrogen to become hydroxide. And so this must be our acid. And by convention, this must be our base. Hydroxide is our conjugate base, excuse me. And HCN must be the conjugate acid of our cyanide. So hydrogen cyanide is pretty reactive. That is a, a term that we've all heard if we watch any science fiction or anything like that, um, spy movies. All right, looking at C, same story. It looks like the species with SO4 gives up its proton. So that's going to be our Bronsted acid and its conjugate base. And chloride takes on a proton. So that's going to be our base. Excuse me. Yes. Yes. And it's conjugate acid. All right, last one. We have dihydrogen sulfide and Boy, I can never remember these on the fly, but it looks like our sulfur compound is giving up a hydrogen. And so that must be our acid and the corresponding conjugate base. And this nitrogen compound must be our base with its conjugate acid. Okay. So this next one is a good example of water and its ionization constant at non-standard temperature. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and write this now. The standard, sometimes this is denoted with that, that not symbol up at the top, Kw of water is just 10 to the negative 14. And the pH scale is on a logarithmic scale up to 14, with 14 being the most basic and less than one being extremely acidic, right? So this value is important. And the ionization constant is when you have this equilibrium of, actually, let me write this. 
So H2O is self-ionizing to form hydronium and hydroxide in that aqueous solution. Anytime that you're dealing with a K value, you are looking at the concentration of products over the concentration of reactants. And this should be review from last term. It's just good to touch on again. So the ionization constant for water KW is 9.311 times 10 to the negative 14 at 60 degrees Celsius. Calculate the concentration of hydronium and hydroxide, pH and the pOH for pure water at 60 degrees Celsius. So let's take this a little bit further. Now that I've done this review, I'm just going to get rid of it. Those are just good reminders. Let's start with our balanced equation. We have water in equilibrium with hydronium and hydroxide aqueous. Balancing this, we would need two. Okay. So our KW, which we're given, equals 9.311 times 10 to the negative 14 equals our hydronium. I'm just going to shorthand that as hydrogen times hydroxide all over one. And this one is important because our reactant is this water on the left side of our equation. And because it's liquid, because there's so much of it, we basically don't need to worry about its concentration. And so we write it as the value one. So, From this, we can basically do some algebra. We have 9.311 times 10 to the negative 14. And we'll say that this is x because it's um, auto-ionizing. The hydronium and the hydroxide, hydroxide concentrations are going to be equivalent to each other. And so both are the value of x or this can simply be written as x squared. Take the square root. x equals, we can actually do this in our head. So when you take the square root of an exponent, you are simply, um, the rule is you divide it in half. So if it's, since it's square root, right, we divide 14 by 2, and that gives us our exponent. Yep. And then we roughly know that the square root of 9 is 3 something. And that actually comes out to be 305 times 10 to the negative 7. So that's our x value. And this will be in molar or moles per liter. Let me make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Okay, so that equals X, which is both our hydronium concentration and our hydroxide concentration. So that's two answers down already. Now we need to calculate from this pH and pOH. And as I was um, reviewing these concepts for where this lecture, I was introduced to a new way of explaining this. Uh, and that is, you know, when you have the P of something, P, K, P, O, H, P, H, you're basically talking about the, the distance from zero, I, I think was how they explained it. So P of anything is going to be negative log 10. Wow, if I can write 
negative log base 10. So pH equals negative log times the concentration of hydrogen ions, which we said was this POH value, or not POH, sorry, hydronium. So 3.05 times 10 to the negative 7. And that, just plugging that into our calculator, we should get 6.515. So this is a, I, we would say this is weakly acidic, 7 being neutral, right? So 6.515, this is our pH and it's our pOH because we said earlier, as we said earlier, water's auto ionizing at this, uh, in this state. And so there's an equal concentration of hydronium and hydroxide. Okay. So for this next one, I'm going to write down a couple of relationships that are important to keep in mind. Um, a moment ago, we talked about the ionization constant for water, Kw, and how that was 10 to the negative 14. Kw is always going to equal the acid constant times the base constant. So if you know any two of those, you can determine the third. Another relationship to keep in mind is that pH plus pOH is always going to equal 14. And finally, just to reiterate that previous relationship that we just demonstrated, pH equals negative log times the concentration of hydrogen in your solution. So for exercise 18, calculate the pH and the pOH of each of the following solutions at 25 degrees Celsius, so standard temperature, for which the substances ionize completely. And this completely is also important. You will notice that all of these, I'm going to do this in blue, are strong acids or bases, respectively. Um, these are species that you will just need to memorize. There are charts in your textbook that are really helpful for this. You should be able to know immediately that HCl is, uh, is a strong acid. Strong meaning it will dissociate completely. All right, so calculating pH. We are given a concentration of 0.2 moles per liter. This is a strong acid. All of those hydrogens are going to yeet themselves from their chlorides. And so we can calculate this using this negative log equation. So the pH equals negative log times 0.2. And that's going to give us 0.69. POH equals 14 minus that. So there's your pH, there's your POH. Let's skip B, let's do our other acid first. For this one, same story. negative log times three. This is a very, very, very high concentration for a strong acid. Plugging this in our calculator, we actually get a negative number. So there's your pH. Okay. 
pOH then minus a negative, we simply add. And this goes right off of our pH scale. So this is a frightening substance that I hope you never encounter in the real world. Going back now. So for B, we have 0 0.0143 molar of sodium hydroxide. So let's start with pOH, since we're dealing with hydroxide, which is going to dissociate from the sodium salt. And it's really the same story. You just need to keep track of which value you are solving for. And this is going to give you 1.84 is your pOH. Works forwards and backwards. So 14 minus 1.84 equals 12.16 for our pH. This one is a little, this last one's a little bit different because you will notice that for every calcium, there are two hydroxides associated with it. So when we put this in an aqueous solution and those species dissociate, we're gonna have two hydroxides. So for pOH, We still go with negative log, but it's going to be two times this concentration that we're given, which should give us 2.21. This is extremely basic. pH is simply 14 minus that number, gives us 11. I'm color coding this mostly for my benefit to kind of keep it straight. Um, I hope that I hope that this is helpful for you for you as well because we kind of went you know pH first, then pOH, then pH, then pOH. That can be a little confusing. So when you're doing these on your practice problems, when you're doing these on your exams, be really um, pay really close attention to which one you're solving for. All right. So what are the hydronium and hydroxide ion concentrations in a solution whose pH is 6.52? So going back and looking at these relationships, we said that pH is the negative log times the concentration of hydrogen. or uh, of protons in aqueous solution, we can flip that equation around. The concentration of hydrogens, of protons rather, is 10 to the power of that pH. And that's how you flip that. So, Ten raised to, sorry, negative, negative pH. Very important. Yes. Plugging this into our calculator, you should get three times ten to the negative seven. We need to add our units back in. This is moles per liter or molar. For hydroxide, we have a couple different ways that we can solve this. We can basically take our pH from 14. That gives us our pOH, and then we can solve it the way that we just did. Or alternatively, Remember this relationship where Kw, the ionization constant of water, is 
which is known to us, equals the concentration of hydrogen times the concentration of hydroxide. So Kw we know is 1 times 10 to the negative 14 equals, we've calculated 3.0 times 10 to the negative 7. times our hydroxide. Do a little algebra, rearrange it. So 1 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by 3 times 10 to the negative 7 equals 3.3 times 10 to the negative 8 molar is our hydroxide concentration. So two ways of solving that. Okay, so talking about relative strengths of acids and bases, uh, we're asked to explain why the neutralization reactions of a strong acid and a weak base both gives a weakly acidic solution. And we kind of already touched on this. Um, strong acids, strong acid or SA, totally dissociates. And its conjugate base is going to be a very, very weak acid, or a weak base, rather. Weak conjugate base. A weak base, actually, do I want to explain this aside just yet? No. Weak bases. partially dissociates to form a weak conjugate acid. So this conjugate base formed by the strong acid is so weak that the remainder of your solution is still going to be slightly acidic. And your weak base is not dissociating sufficiently to um, your weak base is weak enough that as it forms its conjugate base, the base, or as it forms its conjugate acid, rather, the conjugate acid is sufficient to push the solution towards the acidic side. But this weak, whoa, the weak conjugate acid has a greater relative impact on the solution because the base that formed it was also weak. Qualitative reasoning here. All right. So the odor of vinegar is due to the presence of acetic acid, CH3CO2H, which is a weak acid list in order of descending concentration all of the ionic and molecular species present in a one molar aqueous solution of this acid. Let's start here by writing out a balanced chemical equation. Just if for no other reason, so aqueous, then we can kind of track what's happening. So this is going to be in equilibrium. Acetic acid is going to give up its proton and take on a negative charge. Water is going to take up that proton, forming hydronium. You could also write this as just protons, right? And there is, there is a secret third product, and we actually do need to talk about it, but I'm going to put a little star by it, and that is the hydroxide that that water is also going to form as it auto-ionizes. So here we have our 
weak acid. They've given us a nice starting point, right? They've told us as much. Water then must be our base. Our acid's going to lose a charge and water is going to take on a positive charge. So this is our strong conjugate acid and our conjugate base. Okay. Going in descending order. So we're gonna talk high to low here. Descending concentration. Um, this is in aqueous medium. So water has to be our most abundant species. There's more water than anything else here. Acetic acid, uh, the, the solute being dissolved in water is a weak acid. It's not going to dissociate completely. And so we can make some assumptions here that there's gonna be plenty of that acetic acid left over so I'm gonna go ahead and assume that that is our next most abundant species. Um, looking at this, it follows then that the conjugate base of that acid is going to be in, it, it should be, um, well, no. Sorry, I almost misspoke. So the conjugate base, of that acid would be next up. And then that should be in equal concentration. How do I want to write this? I wrote it as uh, just protons up here, so I'll, I'll write it the same way. Um, our conjugate base is going to be in equal concentration with the conjugate acid uh, that we created. And then our least abundant species is going to be um, that hydroxide, which is also forming, but to a lesser degree. Cool. And all of these are going to be less than one mole per liter because that's what we started with. All right, more practical application. So gastric juice, the digestive fluid produced in the stomach contains hydrochloric acid, HCl. This should be familiar. It's on that list of strong acids. Milk of magnesia, a suspension of solid magnesium hydroxide in an aqueous medium is sometimes used to neutralize excess stomach acid. Write a complete balanced equation for the neutral neutralization reaction and identify the conjugate acid-base pairs. All right, I'm gonna start with the new one. So we're given milk of magnesia, which has those two hydroxides associated with it. Um, and this is a solid suspended in aqueous medium. All right, they give us that. Plus, we're combining this with the acid in our stomach. So this is our hydrochloric acid, which is aqueous. Since this is a strong acid, uh, we know it's gonna dissociate completely. We're really only concerned about looking at this in one direction. So what's gonna happen? Magnesium is gonna dissociate from hydroxide. Protons are going to dissociate from our acid. So when magnesium dissociates, whoop, come on now. Each one has a positive charge. This is aqueous. We're going to have our chlorides, each having a negative charge. And we're going to have 
water as a byproduct. And if you're not sure how I got there, we have hydrogen and hydroxide together, forming this nice neutral water as a byproduct, and this will be liquid. Uh, this is not a balanced equation, so let's go ahead and do that really quick. Magnesium's balanced, we have two oxygens, so let's go ahead and do those. That pumps up the number of hydrogens we have, so we're gonna need more of those. And chlorides. So this should be balanced now. We have our bronsted Lowry acid and our bronsted Lowry base. Conjugate base. And this one actually kind of threw me. I assumed that magnesium would be the conjugate acid associated with this dissociation, but it is not. Water is the conjugate acid associated with this base. Magnesium is our salt. You do sometimes have um, metals as usually your acid, I think. Um, but in this case, we have our magnesium salt. I'm pretty sure that answers all of our questions here. Yep. All right. Which is the stronger base, triethylamine or dihydrogen borate? And how do you know? Um, this is one where you just have to look up some tabulated values. But it's really easy. It's really easy to find some of these, but not others. For example, um, I was able to find a Ka, so an acid dissociation constant. For our dihydrogen borate, a 5.4 times 10 to the negative 10, but that doesn't tell us anything directly about how basic it is, which is what this question is asking. And then our triethylamine, we have a base dissociation constant, or Kb of 6.3 times 10 to the negative five. So the question is, how do we get from Ka to Kb? You will remember that Kw equals Ka times Kb. We know Kw. And we know Ka. And so we can find Kb this way equals 1.9 times 10 to the negative 5. So now we have two values that we can compare directly. Which one's more basic? The answer here is a high Kb, or high K whatever you're comparing. means increased basicity. So 6.3 times 10 to the negative five greater than or less than 1.9 times 10 to the negative five. It is less than. So triethylamine is our more basic species. Okay.
rank the compounds in each of the following groups in order of increasing acidity or basicity as indicated and explain the order you assign. So we're only doing B and D here. And I have drawn some charts here um, to explain our periodic trends. Oop, come on now. Okay. For basicity, we have our periodic table. Basicity increases as you go up the periodic table and to the left. Right. So hydrogen's over here, fluorine's over here. Right. It also increases, uh, sorry, electronegativity increases as you go up and to the right. Okay. So this is the trend to keep in mind as we look at B. And right away, a couple things are jumping out to me. And that is that I have hydrogen here with a negative charge on it. Right. This is all the way at the top and all the way left on our periodic table. These are really unstable in nature. It does not want to exist. This is going to be our most basic species. Followed by hydroxide, which is on all of our really strong acids and bases, um, following kind of the same conventions, right? You could also look at this and say, you know, you have chloride on here, which is really high on the periodic table, but it's also all the way to the right. It's very electronegative. Oxygen is slightly less electronegative than that, and hydroxide also has this pro this uh, hydrogen attached to it, and so hydroxide is going to be a stronger base than is your chloride. And actually, I need to move that even further over because. Water is going to be even more basic than our chloride. I'm realizing now that I've written this in decreasing order, uh, but hopefully because I have these you know, inequalities here, that, that makes it clear which one is, is greater. I'll try and do this correctly for the next one. So for binary acids, that is you know, think of HCl, we're splitting two species, it's binary. Um, things get more acidic as you go towards the right-hand side of your periodic table. And again, we have that same uh, trend for electronegativity. Things that are more electronegative are going to be okay by themselves um, or happy to take on that additional uh, negative charge. So looking at this one, um, right away, only one of the species on this list is a strong acid, that's hydrogen fluoride. So we can go ahead, I'm gonna do this the right direction this time. That's our strongest acid. Uh, looking at these, we have water, ammonia, and methane. Oxygen, pretty far right on that periodic table. We have a couple protons attached to it, but we're not too worried about that. Nitrogen is even a little bit more over, but we've got more of these protons. So we could also we could also think about this in terms of uh, well, I don't know if we want to talk about free electrons in this case or how basic they are. Yeah, we're still in Bronsted Lowry territory. Never mind. We're, our our focus is completely on completely on protons. And methane is going to be your weakest acid um, in this case. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm satisfied with that. Which of the following will increase the percent of ammonia that is converted to the ammonium ion in water? And reminder that ammonium is this NH4, the positive charge associated to it. 
would the addition of sodium hydroxide, hydrochloric acid, or ammonium chloride increase the percent of ammonia that is converted to ammonium ion in water? I think this one can be solved really, really simply using uh, Le Chatelier's principles that we learned last term. Um, if we have NH3 and, well, we'll put a question mark, and we want to convert those to NH4s plus whatever byproduct, um, we need some source of hydrogen, right? to add to that ammonia. And looking at these, sodium hydroxide, eh, not a good source of protons. Hydrochloric acid, good source of protons. Ammonium chloride, we have the product of interest in here. And so, excuse me, adding this to our solution might actually push it towards the left, back towards reactants and give us more NH3, which we don't want. So just by process of elimination that way, we can kind of rule these out. Um, our answer here, I think, is hydrochloric acid. Yeah. Addition of acid or source of protons pushes reaction forward. I'm satisfied with that explanation. All right, so calculate the concentration of all solute species in each of the following solutions of acids or bases. Assume that the ionization of water can be neglected and show that the changes in the initial concentrations can be neglected. You're going to have to look up Ka values for these. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to do the first one here because it's pretty, this should look familiar. So we have HClO in equilibrium with dissociated protons and ClO. And this, it should be noted, this short trick, uh, shortcut can really only be used for uh, acids. So, we're given an initial concentration, pulling out those rice tables, zero and zero for our products. The change is negative x, positive x, little equal signs, nine, two, excuse me minus x, x, and x. But we've assumed that the ionization of wa water can be neglected and show that the change in the initial concentrations can be neglected. So we're not even going to worry about this part. Not yet, anyways. Right? So we have our reactant here, and it's Ka, which is a tabulated value you need to look up. It's 29, 2.9, excuse me, 2.9 times 10 to the negative eight. And we need to calculate the concentrations of all solute species. All right. So with this, we know that we can figure out some hydrogen ion concentrations. I still haven't found a great way. How do I get rid of you? Hmm. 
You're banned. Goodbye. All right. So we're given a Ka value. Uh, we know from that that we can figure out some other things. So w stop me when this starts looking familiar. We've got Ka equals products over reactants and and we know each of these. So 2.9 times 10 to the negative 8 equals x, excuse me. Which is going to be equivalent to our hydroxides. And we have our initial concentration. Or excuse me, not hydroxides. Um, protons, conjugate base, x times x. There we go. So x squared. Now we have an equation that we can solve. Uh, we multiply both sides by 0 0.0092, gives us x squared equals 2.668 times 10 to the negative 10. Square root of that, square root both sides, x equals 1.6 times 10 to the negative 5. And that is our concentration of protons and our concentration of conjugate base. OK, so that's two down. Uh, so question in the chat, since we stopped for a moment, I'm wondering if you ever offer through three to four chem help for organic. Uh, I am not currently tutoring organic chemistry is the short answer. Thank you for the question. I would love to. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so that's one set of answers. We have our concentration of protons and conjugate base, and next, we can figure out our final concentration of the initial reactant using this. So now, now we are going to worry about that x. We have 0 0.0092 minus 1 1.6 times 10 to the negative 5 equals is a very, very, very small change. And this is kind of why we're showing this. This change in value is almost insignificant. Uh, but that is our, oop, come on now. That is our concentration of HClO, our original reactant. We're most of the way there. We still need to figure out our concentration of hydroxides. And we can do this by using this relationship that I wrote down earlier. So we have Kw over concentration of protons. So we have 1 times 10 to the negative 14 over protons was 1.6 times 10 to the negative 5. 
gives us 6.25 times 10 to the negative 10. And that should be all of the species involved in this reaction. Cool. So what we can conclude from this is that this is a very, very weak acid to begin with, right? The change, the change in concentration is negligible. Uh, we're going to skip this one. Yeah, we're going to skip this one. 14.4, hydrolysis of salts. So I've, I've written some rules here that you will want to remember. Um, strong acids will dissociate completely and form relatively neutral conjugate bases. Weak acids will dissociate partially and form weak conjugate bases. Strong bases, strong bases will dissociate and form neutral conjugate acids. Weak bases will dissociate to form weak conjugate acids. So using those, we can really look at the following dissociations and kind of, you're, you're basically, um, okay, determine whether the aqueous solutions of the following salts are acidic, basic, or neutral. Um, really, we want to look at the conjugates and their relative stability, and that will Using, using these rules up above, and that will kind of tell us what the resulting solution is going to look like. So for this one here, what we're going to end up with um, is aluminum with a three positive charge is going to take on three hydroxides. And this is a weak base. And those nitrates are going to take, each take on a proton. This is a fairly strong acid when those dissociate, right? So these are our conjugates. And on their own, um, they do pretty well. So strong acid forms a weak conjugate base. This is going to result in a neutral conjugate, right? So. This particular solution, um, our weak base forms a relatively strong in, in this context. Because this is a strong acid, we can kind of negate its impact on the solution. The weak base over here is going to have a nice conjugate acid. So overall, the final solution is going to be weakly acidic. It's not a ton. This is not, and I'm looking at this now, this is not the most organized way of doing it, but it works for me. Um, so rubidium and iodine, we kind of have a, uh, did I just skip this one too? I did, we're not doing that one. All right. Potassium. And, HCO2, dissociate. Uh, potassium on its own will have a positive charge associated with it, so those are going to take on protons really easily. Excuse me, not protons, hydroxides to balance out their negative and positive charges. So you just get rid of those. And we're gonna get an extra proton over here. When these dissociate, this is a strong base, right? It dissociates, the conjugate is basically neutral. So we don't have to worry about that one. This is a weak acid, is gonna form a weak conjugate base. The overall solution is going to be weakly basic. And let's do this last one. We get our split right here. 
Bromine's really electronegative. It's perfectly happy being off by itself. That's going to take on protons to balance out that charge. And hydroxide's going to go over here. Uh, the other way... Mm, no, we're not going to look at it that way. This is not on our list of strong bases. This is a weak base. So its conjugate is going to be weakly acidic. Hydrogen bromide is a strong acid. Its conjugate is going to be basically neutral. So we can ignore it. The overall impact on this solution is going to be weakly acidic. OK. Wow, it is 5 p.m. already. Um, and good thing, because that's all I have for you. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. And uh, I, again, I won't be live streaming at the usual time next week. Um, I will be recording the night before. So you'll be able to find the recording on the Twitch channel or on the PSU Learning Center YouTube channel, um, either one. So I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to seeing you next week.